Your Honor, uh, may it please the court, we're here this morning on a couple of motions in 2021 CS 15-592-593-594-595. Uh, those are the two murder charges and possession of a firearm during commission of a violent crime charges against Alec Murdoch uh, for the murders of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. Uh, we're here for the state's motion for a protective order. So Objection, Your Honor, we're not here for that. We're here for the defense motion to compel and I ob object to the state trying to hijack this proceeding by taking over and saying this is for their motion for protective order. We made a motion to compel weeks before they made their motion for protective order, and I'd ask the court to allow us to go forward with our motion to compel. Your Honor, uh, both motions are to be heard today, and I think that if the motion to, for protective order is addressed, it makes any motion to compel uh, move, because of course, as the state has been clear from day one, we've been ready to provide this discovery, but because of the sensitivity of the matters here, uh, we think it's appropriate out of an abundance of caution to seek a reasonable and minimally intrusive protective order uh, so that that discovery can be provided. The second it's provided, there is no need for a motion to compel. If it please the court, Your Honor, we have a motion to compel. We filed, we'd like to be heard on it, and then if they want to respond, Your Honor obviously could hear that. But we filed this motion weeks after they failed to comply with Rule 5 and Brady, and to just ignore that. I think does a disservice to this court and the criminal justice system. The only reason why those Your Honor, I'm not done. If I could be heard without being interrupted and hijacked me, and hijacked by the, the state as they continue to try to hide the ball on this case, I'm sorry if I appear upset, but I can tell you that every time we turn around, they're trying to hide something. And if we could just have 15 minutes to address the court and call a witness, we could get to it. Your Honor, to set the table appropriately, I think the protective order, which is what started this whole issue, is the way to set the table. And I would point out that Mr. Harpooley stood up and interrupted me as I was trying to set that table. Your Honor, that table has never been set because they won't comply with Rule 5. They could have raised this protective order issue eight, seven weeks ago and didn't do it. So That's Honor, because the defense had agreed to it up until uh, after Your Honor, hour. again, if I would be allowed to finish without being interrupted, I know he's head of the statewide grand jury. I know he's a very important guy. But my client has a right to a fair trial, and a fair trial means a motion compelled to find out what it is we're trying to compel and not have the attorney general continue to try to hide behind whatever this is, protective order. Your Honor's opened this courtroom. You issued an order denying a gag order. You issued an order saying this is going to be a public trial, and yet the Attorney General continues to try to make it a star chamber event. I'd like the ability to make my argument and call one witness. All right. Um, Mr. Waters, if you will be seated, and I will not have both counsel arguing with each other and not to the court. Yes, sir. Mr. Harpootian, before the court is a motion to compel and a motion for a protective order. That's approved. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, by way of explanation, and I'm going to be extremely brief because we have filed, again this morning, we have filed a very exhaustive memorandum describing the issue. And we received it five minutes before it began. And, and, and I apologize, but we got the state's position late Friday afternoon. We worked on the weekend, um, and we couldn't file it until uh, this morning. We actually emailed it, and apparently there's some, maybe it's too large or whatever. But, but suffice it to say, it points out all the things that we pointed out in our initial motion to compel. And that is, under Rule 5 and Brady, we're entitled to discover materials to prepare a defense. The question is, who's going to make the decision on what we get. And Your Honor, we're going to be in this courtroom over and over and over again if Your Honor enters a protective order. I'm not going to argue about that at this moment. But uh, clearly, I, I've been involved in literally dozens, if not hundreds, of murder cases in my career. I've never seen such a thing in a murder case. Now, a statewide grand jury? Certainly, there's a grand jury. There's protective orders in place. I get it. But this is not a statewide grand jury case. So why we don't have what we asked for seven weeks ago? The 30 days is not the minimum, it's the maximum, number one. Number two, um, I'd like uh, to put one witness on the stand to sort of explain where we are. Well, you don't need to explain to me who this witness is and 
the need for it to be with Yes, sir. And a motion to compare with Captain Ryan Neal. Uh, he is with SWED. He's been involved in this process and the gathering of the evidence, which I think would explain to the court how easy it is for this evidence to be produced. Ten minutes max. Your Honor, I don't see any need for a witness at this time. I don't think that there's any factual issue to dispute for the purposes of this hearing as to the evidence that was gathered. These are legal issues as to whether or not a protective order is appropriate and whether or not uh, the defense's motion to be compelled should be granted. Uh, and there's no reason to even get to factual, uh, which he's failed to identify a viable factual issue that's in dispute. Uh, I know Mr. Harpooling would love to get a witness on the stand, uh, but uh, to, to make this clear, the state wants nothing more than to have a fair trial in this case. I don't want to have to try this case more than once. I want to do it right the first time. But having this sort of uh, you know, evidentiary hearing this early on when there's no factual issue in dispute is uh, completely unwarranted. Let's get to the legal issues. And let's, if your honor is satisfied after the legal argument to, to make a ruling, that's all we need to do here today. Give a please, court, your honor. This impacts the legal issue. We don't, we're not quite sure what we're asking for. I think this would make it clear to you what we're asking for and whether or not it's easily available. Again, five minutes. Rule 5A2 provides that uh, the disclosure rule does not authorize the discovery or inspection of reports, memorandum, or other internal prosecution documents made by the attorney for the prosecution or other prosecution agents in connection with the investigation or prosecution of the case or of statements made by prosecution witnesses or prospective witnesses. The motion before the court to compel discovery should be court grant the motion to compel discovery of the state and as the court is bound to, uh, to compel, uh, the state then must produce discovery. If the defense does not get an opportunity to uh, interrogate the state's witnesses concerning the nature and extent of its investigation, so I'm not going to allow a witness for that purpose. Your Honor, if I might make one comment. I'm not arguing with your decision. In the memorandum that we received on Friday, the state points out that they don't want other suspects who were interviewed disclosed. Well, if they interviewed other people that they considered to be suspects and excluded them, why aren't we entitled to that? Why aren't we entitled to that, to know who they suspected, why they suspected them, and on what basis they excluded them? They absolutely will be, Your Honor. Well, Your Honor, we, and once we have the rules in place for the discovery. Well, the rules are in place. It's called Rule 5 and Brady. So, Your Honor, what I would say to you is this. I don't trust the state to honor the rules. They haven't so far, as we point out in our motion. I ask the court to appoint a special master to supervise discovery in this case. Uh, a number of uh, retired judges have done this in the past. Not because you can't do it, but because it would consume all of your time to do it. Someone like a retired Justice Chief, Chief Justice Toll, uh, uh, there are a number of them out there that do it in civil cases all the time. So I'd ask the court to consider appointing a master to supervise the state uh, in reviewing, if, in, in assisting them in reviewing the documents, to make sure we get what we should get. Thank you. Your Honor. Mr. Arpudley put in his latest filing that, as Your Honor pointed out, we got five minutes before the hearing started, uh, that he knows he's worked with me on a number of cases and knows I don't play fast and loose. They put that in their motion. Knows that I'm not responsible for any leaks. They put that in that motion. They will get everything. Okay, I don't play fast and loose with discovery. I would rather give them everything because I don't want to be down the line, you know, with anything that I had that they could potentially have found useful. That's how I play the game, and they both know this because they've had experience with me before. And as soon as we can get a ruling on the protective work, because of the extreme sensitivity of this information, uh, you know, this information, Your Honor, is probably worth six to seven figures. I am not at all, and I put this in my motion despite their recent response, at all worried about Dick Arcudley and or Jim Griffin selling this information. 
I'm not at all worried about that. But the problem is, is that inevitably a number of people, as the case is prepared, have to get access to that information. And the whole point is to have this not fall in the, in the wrong hands. This case is unique, it's unprecedented in South Carolina history. And as much as it combines violent crime with uh, alleged corruption of someone's law license on a, on a scale that's never been seen before. And Your Honor, if, if not this case, what case would a protective order be appropriate with the intense media interest that there's there? None of this is to preclude a public trial. Everything will come out in the open. All this is meant to do is have it come out when it's supposed to, and that's in this courtroom. And again, defense counsel was completely on board with this up until after 5 a.m. and Friday before the discovery was due on Monday, and they changed their mind. And I feel before I'm the one to authorize and press a button and disseminate this information that has such value to at least out of abundance of caution say, Your Honor, if not this case, what case is a protective order uh, warranted? And there's a few reasons for that, Your Honor. I, I, I think, and I've cited in there, I've cited in there uh, the this, this Smith case, which is a Southern District of New York, Manhattan is probably the most important district, uh, one of them in the nation. And there was an exhaustive discussion in a very high profile public corruption case of all those particular issues. And in that particular uh, um, decision that really synthesized a lot of other decisions, the first thing they note is, is that there's no First Amendment or very limited First Amendment aspects to pretrial discovery. This is not what's going to come out in court at the time. This is pretrial discovery. So that's not really a concern for Your Honor. So the other concern is, is whether or not there's any sort of good cause in the case for the court to authorize a protective order. And again, I would say, given the unprecedented and unique nature of this case, if not this case, what case? But it's pointed to a number of factors that are relevant. And one of those is, of course, is protection of the privacy and the rights of third parties. And Your Honor, I think in this particular case, uh, we have in this evidence, uh, it's chock full of such information uh, that should be protected. Uh, there are phone dumps from a number of people, from, from victims, from witnesses. Those phone dumps have all kinds, are complete. They have all kinds of communications with people. Their contact information is in there, uh, who may have nothing to do with this case, but we're just contacting that phone. But I would not want to get into the process, which would take forever, I might add, Your Honor, of, of sitting there and trying to separate the wheat from the trap and the phone dumps before it was provided to the defense, which then they would complain that the state is withholding discovery. I'd rather them have the whole thing because I don't know what they may see in there that they think is relevant to their defense, which is their right, which is why I don't want to be separating wheat from the trap. Let them look at all of it and decide what they think is relevant. That's how I play the game, and they know this. Uh, Your Honor, there is uh, information in there. There's, there's tons of personal identifying information in there um, that a protective order would satisfy any issues as it goes to that. Uh, and then, of course, I did mention there's excluded uh, suspects, that premature uh, uh, disclosure of which would be damaging, but none of that is to preclude them from having it. They are entitled to it. They're entitled to, to vet that themselves and raise those issues if legally appropriate. They can do that all they want to, but it is appropriate that those people's identities be protected under protective order unless and until those issues become relevant at trial. And that could be after your honor rules on various legal issues relevant to that. That's a huge right of a third party. And then, of course, most of the witnesses in this case who have their MOIs, memorandums of interview, their recordings of their interview, all the rest of them, they don't want to be in the news unless and until it's a, a, a trial happens. And that's that's their right. That's important it's something to protect, Your Honor, that they don't need to have intense media focus on them until and unless they, their testimony becomes relevant in the trial. These are all very valid concerns alone to justify um, a protective order. The second uh, issue that was mentioned in the Smith case is ongoing investigation. And while this has been a long-standing investigation, as Your Honor is aware, there are related cases that are going on. And additionally, in any complex case, the case always remains uh, ongoing as things, uh, as things develop as you move to trial. That's an inevitability in any sort of complex case. In this case, with all of the unprecedented interest, that justifies protection. Uh, additionally, there are related state grand jury cases, which are already subject to the standard protective order, which is very similar to the standing protective order that's in the federal district court. They have a protective order as to everything. And because there's so much overlap between the evidence in the state grand jury cases and this murder case, where one of them uh, represents a long-standing course of conduct, of criminal conduct, alleged criminal conduct that culminated uh, in, in ultimately the allegations of what happened uh, on the night that Paul and Maggie were killed. Because of that, because of that overlap, it only makes good prudent sense to have all of the information subject to similar rules going forward. 
Uh, and then finally, of course, is to protect the process. And again, my concern is not Dick Harpootley, it's not Jim Griffin. I've worked with both of these people and they both said the same thing about me. But inevitably, whether when it's not authorized, it's not directed, uh, inevitably though, this information could end up down the line as, as the case is prepared in the hands of people that, whose motives aren't as pure. And all of this is done is to protect that because this information literally is probably worth over a million dollars. Uh, to, the, uh, to an unscrupulous hands. And I think we have to protect it for that reason. I say again, Your Honor, if not this case, what case would a protect order be uh, appropriate? We have been ready, and the defense knows that. We were having conversations with them the week prior. We were talking about a protective order. They raised not the slightest concern about it. They even edited it, the protective order and cleared it for submission to you and then changed their mind. And that has been the only delay in why the button hadn't been pressed in the Discovery Center. There's been no uh, improper motive, improper collusion on the part of the state, uh, none of that. And then, then as, as far as any issues with leaks, uh, Your Honor, I have not leaked a thing, okay? I am not aware of anyone who's leaked any substantive evidence or any violated rule for 3.6 in this matter, okay? Leaks do nothing but provide, make it look amateurish, make it look messy, and provide a strategic opportunity for the defense. Those who know how to handle a high-profile case don't leak because it does you no good whatsoever, Your Honor. Uh, and the only thing I am aware of are two indiscretions about procedural issues that were immediately addressed. Uh, and both in both of those instances, it was just simply about a step in the process, and both of those were unauthorized, undirected, and were immediately addressed, addressed and had nothing to do with any substantive evidence, nothing to do with any state grand jury evidence, and nothing like that. The way that we practice state grand jury, we, our practice is very much different from the feds. The feds don't put as much, intend, they don't tend to put as much witnesses in front of the grand jury as we do. As your honor is well aware, because you're of course serving as the state grand jury judge, we tend to put a lot of uh, witnesses in there and exhaustively vet that testimony under oath, uh, and we believe that there are significant advantages to, to that. But while the attorneys and law enforcement and the jurors and the court reporter are all sworn to secrecy, the witnesses are not. And we ethically have to advise them on the record that you're not subject to this secrecy, although we ask you to use discretion if you talk at all. So if sometimes there's some reporting in the media that, oh, indictments are imminent, when a number of witnesses have been testifying during a term, many of whom are represented by counsel. It's not hard to figure out what's going on, but I'll point out, Your Honor, that many times those reports were made and nothing came out because the assumption was being made that because testimony was taking place, there were going to be indictments that month, and there weren't. And the same, even in their motion right here, they dis they discuss that as well. They, claim, they point out some Fitz News article from June calling out the fact that no indictments had been issued when they were expected, they were expected, they were expected. Well, that was it. Everybody was looking for when the Colleton, the next Colleton grand jury date was and expecting indictments, but nothing happened. So why in the world would the state be leaking that? We have no motive to do that. All it does is undermine our case and undermine the process. And I'll say that again, Your Honor. I only want to try this case once. And, and the evidence can come out in the courtroom, and that's the place where it needs to come out. And, and all a protective order does is ensure, or tries its best to ensure, that that's the case. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Please, of course, Your Honor. Um, let me sort of address the overarching issue. <coughs> Rule 5 requires a very specific, if you point out in our memo, a very specific motion as to why a very specific piece of evidence should, not, should be put under a protective order. That's not what this motion does. This motion says all of it. Now, for instance, if he were to say that he's concerned about somebody selling autopsy photos um, or uh, crime scene photos that we saw in California recently, somebody uh, uh, got fined 15 million, a jury found $15 million verdict against them. Um, that's not the issue. If, if he wants those protected, we're fine with that. In terms of phone records, um, a protective order on phone records um, if, if uh, Your Honor uh, were to grant a general protective order on all these phone dumps, that's going to inhibit us, our ability to talk to people, to investigate, to issue subpoenas, to do the sorts of things that we're going to have to do to get to investigate this case. He had the opportunity back in April, the day that we served the motion, to file this motion for protective order and didn't do it. He waited till the 30 days 
to file this. And we got it on a Friday afternoon at 4.15. We looked at it. After we thought about it for a minute, we said, this is ridiculous, and said no. And so here you are today. He wants to put a blanket protective order on whatever we get. Two things. One, we're officers of the court. We're officers of the court. I've never, ever sold, given, handed anybody anything in violation of the rules of professional conduct, ever. Almost 50 years of doing this. Mr. Griffin and I understand he's a former federal prosecutor. I'm a former state prosecutor. That our job is to represent our client. Our job is not to create a PR storm out there, number one. Number two, these folks over here, I'm sure they would pay money to get something, but they're not going to pay us. And why would we share, if, again, if it's autopsy photos and crime scene photos, we would agree to a protective order on those that we, we only be able to show them to people that we need to show them to, experts, for instance. Not a problem. But for it to come in under Rule 5, D1, and just say everything, he didn't. he's not made the showing that's required under the federal, state, federal cases, there is no state cases, or um, even under uh, the state rule. We are entitled, as Your Honor has already indicated, we're limited to what we get, although I think we're going to be litigating a lot about that because I think there's plenty of ESI information. Plenty of ESI information. That is, in terms of Brady, let me give, let me give you an example. SLED has, nobody does paper anymore. Everybody does electronics. So when they prepare an incident report, it goes in, and then it may be changed. And when it's changed, there's metadata that shows how it was changed. And we ought to be able to aware, be aware of what those changes were to see if it made any substantive difference in what they're saying today. That's, that's why we want the ESI. We want all their electronic uh, data. And so that we can do that analysis. And I'll be happy uh, to enter into some sort of uh, limited protective order on the ESI data be, uh, so that we can uh, have that analysis. That's number one. Number two. I have not accused and will not accuse Mr. Waters of leaking anything, ever, ever. However, uh, when, Cap and the reason I wanted to call uh, Captain Neal was he, when he met with the family prior to indictments, they were outraged that it was already in the paper. And, and Captain Neal, according to the family, indicated that the Attorney General's office, some low-level person in the Attorney General's office, had leaked it. Now, I trust Mr. Waters don't trust the rest of his office. I just want to make that clear. Because these leaks, some of them were accurate. Apparently, of course, we don't have the discovery. We don't know. But I would ask you, if you're going to issue a protective order, make it only protective as to what we consent to at this point without a specific showing under D1. And D1 requires them to tell you it needs to be protected because of this. And if they're worried about somebody getting the... Uh, the autopsy photos or getting the crime scene photos and trying to profit off of them. We will not be a part of that and would consent to any sort of protective order you want to put in place. As to phone data, as to any other reports, as to ESI, there's no protective order needed um, except in a very limited circumstance. Now, we're going to be looking for witnesses and if they redact addresses, phone numbers, social security numbers, uh, we're not going to be able to do that very effectively in three or four months, which is what we need to do. The, the, the last thing I'd say is this. This is not a statewide grand jury case. It is a Carlton County murder case. The statewide grand jury has no statutory authority whatsoever to investigate a murder case. It's not one of the enumerated crimes. It's not one of the things the legislature said, you should investigate murders. Child porn drugs, money laundering, those sorts of things. Now, if he were to say that perhaps this was uh, something that started, as I understand, it started uh, back with the boat case as sort of a public corruption case. And I would note um, that there is a statute, if I can find it, um, which says this, that if, in fact, the statewide grand jury begins an investigation, um, that and they want to they want to um, section 14 7 16 once the state grand jury is entered into a term the attorney general solicitor in the appropriate case 
may notify the presiding judge in writing as often as is necessary and appropriate. The state grand jury's areas of inquiry have been expanded or additional areas of inquiry have been added there too. They can go in another direction. Murder's not one of them. Murder's not one of them. Number one, number two, we've been given on the financial crimes, not on the murder, a number of uh, statewide grand jury materials, not a single order doing this. I can't tell you what I have been given. What I haven't been given was any any anything expanding the inquiry. Um, if there is such an order, I would suggest we get it. And if it concerns murder, um, you know, if they if they took the statewide grand jury and began investigating a murder, these these proceedings may be in jeopardy because the statute doesn't allow them to do it. And there's no case or statute that says, well, if the murder was related to something else, you can look into the murder. Murder is not an enumerated statewide grand jury offense. And I don't know that we want to make new law in this case. So, Mr. Excuse me, one I'm second. Sorry, I thought you were done. I'm not. <coughs> uh, Mr. Griffin says I am done. Okay. May I go now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, there's going to be no problem in that regard. I'm happy to share uh, the formation documents uh, with Mr. Harpooley, and I believe they've been specifically asked for, but I'm happy to share those with him, but there'll be no issue in that, as Your Honor is, of course, aware. We're standing in Colleton County Court for a murder, and there's a specific state grand jury statute that allows state grand jury information to be shared with a county grand jury or any other appropriate source to aid any investigation that they're doing. Uh, and that's actually expressly in the statute, and, and there's plenty of orders, and, and that will not be an issue. But I'll certainly provide those to the defense, and they can raise whatever legal issue they want to uh, at, at the appropriate time. And we asked for those a year ago. We, we asked did. for those a year those, ago. Those are, not, you know, those are not available until they have no, we'll address the court. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, well, well, certainly I will be happy to address that with Mr. Arbogan, and uh, we will. that's, that's not anything that, that uh, we have a problem sharing, and they can analyze that all they want to. Um, Your Honor, I think it's interesting that he says I've made no showing, but I think I just went into great detail about a showing, and if not this case, what case, with its unique and unprecedented aspects to it, and unique and unprecedented media interest, if not this case, what case. What they haven't done is made any specific showing whatsoever or even claim of how this protective order would in any way impede their ability to prepare their case. And the reason is, is because it won't. Because the language of the order that I've submitted to you is the one that they approved with their edits. There is nothing intended about this order to stop them from using that information to develop witnesses and whatever else they need to do to prepare their case. It does nothing of the sort. It just puts everybody under the same rules of that's as far as it goes until we get to trial. And so they have not identified for you, they tellingly have not identified one issue a uh, specific issue in the language of this proposed order that would impede them in any way. So we're talking about a, a, a prophylactic measure of great value and, and no or minimal intrusion on the activity of the parties. And, and when you balance those factors, Your Honor, I think I would respectfully submit it's a no-brainer uh, that this order should be granted. Uh, one way or the other, uh, once that happens, uh, once, once we get a ruling on this that we felt compelled to do out of an abundance of caution, we are going to share all the discovery that uh, we can that we believe is appropriate and it's always my practice to be extensive in that rather than restrictive and, and both these gentlemen know that and then if they have an issue after that i will be happy to address that with them and if they don't are not happy with the response of the state then we can come back and forward of your honor and address whatever issue we have then but we haven't gotten there yet these are all claims that are premature trying to you know act like that something's happened when it hasn't there has been no violation in yet there has been no misconduct by the state there's been none of that they're just trying to create that before it's happened. Let's get through step one. And if they're unhappy, we'll talk. And if they're still unhappy, they can come to your honor and make whatever motion they want to. But that's not why we're here today. Your honor, we're here today because seven weeks ago, we asked them for discovery. We still don't have it. And by the way, under their order, we can't leave discovery with our client at the jail to read. Now, no, just wait just one minute. Typically, he's dealing with a bunch of drug defendants, I understand, that have co-defendants down at the jail and they don't want him sharing. It's a one defendant case. Why can't we, why can't he have the time to examine the data at the jail? Now, that's where they want him. That's where he's kept. We can't, we have to sit down there with him and read it with him every day. This is ludicrous. And again, what are we protecting it from? 
Well, who are we protecting it from? Again, we've agreed, he says everything needs to be protected. We've agreed certain things perhaps need to be protected. We don't have a problem with it. But if your honor issues a protective order, if A, this is not, it's certainly they can share, share material with, with state grant, with, with grand juries, county grand juries. They're not supposed to be investigating a murder case. They're not supposed to be investigating a murder case. The statute does not allow it. So if they're out there asking witnesses about the murder in a statewide grand jury case, these proceedings are in jeopardy. So what I would ask you getting back to the original issue is, don't issue a blanket protective order. If there's certain things, we think maybe autopsy photos, maybe crime scene photos, um, restrictive use of sharing cell phone records. I don't have a problem with that as long as we can share them with experts and issue subpoenas. Um, we can't issue subpoenas. We have to come to the court for an order, a uh, forthwith order to get material because we don't have the subpoena power. And one other thing I'd like to say is this. They charged him with murder. What they're telling us today is they're still investigating it. They're still investigating the murder they've charged him with. They didn't have enough when they charge him, again, Your Honor, this is some sort of game that's going on here. And he used the word game. That's not my word. This is not a game. It's his life. It's justice. It's the quality of justice in this courtroom, in this state, and it ain't a game. Thank you. I agree. And I apologize for using that word. That's exactly what I'm trying to protect here is the quality of the process in this courtroom. And I, I absolutely realize that. But as far as his concerns about the state grand jury, again, he can get the orders and he can make whatever legal arguments he wants. Uh, but there's not going to be a problem there, Your Honor. Uh, but that's that's a, a, another issue uh, down the line. Uh, we are here in, in a Colleton County murder case, and I understand that very well. I don't just do grand jury cases, I, and that's not where I started from. So that's not the, the, the blending of those two is not going to be a legal problem, but it's really not any issue that we deal with in here. Uh, Your Honor, ultimately, as it relates to Alvin S. Glenn, what better example of what I'm talking about with information that's worth six, if not seven figures, then the idea of leaving that information in Alabama. We're not going to leave autopsy photos or crime scene photos at the jail, Your Honor. We're not going to do that. <coughs> that and so in, in the past, in, in cases like this, with like Bloods and Hell's Angels, and Mr. Griffin, I'm not, sure he's familiar with this. That's one defendant case. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I apologize. I'm losing my, my, my. We can. None of this is to meant, and I'm happy to do anything to facilitate the defense's review of this material and presentation, and they know this. And Mr. Griffin is a former federal prosecutor and knows that protective orders are standard in almost every case, and they go just fine, okay? And so that's that's really why they still haven't identified any specific problem. But with Alvin S. Glenn, we can set up with maybe a secured laptop and rigging room. This has been done before, a manner which ensures that information uh, it cannot be disseminated and then can be uh, retained. There are things that we can do to allow them so that Mr. Griffin or Mr. Arcoolian doesn't have to sit in front of the defendant for hours while he makes that discovery. I'm not trying to impede them. These are mentally intrusive, and Mr. Griffin knows as a former federal prosecutor that it can be done. It's done all the time in virtually every federal criminal case in the District of South Carolina. And that's all we're asking for. Again, Your Honor, if not this case, thank you. Your Honor, may I address the court since I've been addressed? The, uh, th there are routinely in federal court protective orders that in mostly multi-defendant drug cases, and it's mostly for security purposes, for retaliation against witnesses and snitches and things of that nature. And, and so, and there are constrictions in those cases, it's not every federal case, but in those type cases where the defendant is not permitted to have the material at the jail. But I can tell you, Your Honor, that the Alvin S. Glenn Detention Center no longer houses federal inmates because they had a problem making uh, their clients accessible to the federal public defender's office. And every, as my understanding, every federal defendant has been, the pretrial detainee has been removed from the Alvin S. Glenn Detention Center. I think they moved him down to Bamberg because the visitation is so restrictive there. They have gotten better, but it's still one hour at a time, and, and you're in a room with, with other lawyers, you're, you're in a pod, open pod, with other lawyers, and get an hour at a time. And, and there's, there's a bulk of information that, that 
Mr. Murdoch, who is a lawyer who can help us if he has time to review it in his cell, that we would certainly not get. He doesn't want to see crime scene photos, Your Honor. That's the last thing in the world he wants to see. But he needs to assist us in the defense of his case. And the conditions at Alvin S. Glenn Detention Center are not conducive to that. If we have to meet with him for one hour to, to look at some discovery and then wait, you have to get 48 hours notice to schedule an appointment. And it's just not conducive to that. Thank you. Your Honor, first of all, he was a lawyer. Uh, secondly, uh, the fact that he's an Alvin S. Glenn, while that might provide some complication, it's not the state's fault. That's his fault. And that's on him. Uh, but I'm happy to facilitate whatever I can to provide a regional review mechanism. But if it's a, if it's an inconvenience to some extent, to some extent, that's not on the state. That's on the conduct of the defense. Why is Mr. Uh, Murdoch announced this as opposed to Colorado? He's currently there on uh, the seven million dollar state grand jury bond. State grand jury defendants are typically uh, housed at Alvin S. Glenn, which is where the, as your honor is aware, we're looking location of the state grand jury judges who's also the fifth circuit gs admin uh, and so that's why he is uh, housed at alvin s Glenn. but uh, again uh, i'm happy to make whatever calls or add my voice to whatever needs to be added to put in place uh, a reasonable um, measures at the jail so that uh, the defendant can review his materials with uh you know with minimal um reasonable impositions on the defense counsel Brief. We asked for a speedy trial October, November. I believe uh, we've agreed on a January trial. So this is going to take time and we can make motions and, you know, and maybe we get an hour here and an hour there. It's just not conducive to getting this matter resolved and this matter needs to be resolved. He wants it resolved so Slug can go find the person that really did this. Thank you. In any case, the parties have agreed to uh, the January trial date. Yes, sir. The parties do not schedule trial to support this. Your Honor, we, we agree, we understand that ultimately it is the court's decision. But, but um, rarely, in my experience, we agree on a trial date. That's all I'm saying is that that's, you got two of the three parties saying yay, which is, again, not usual. Anything further? <laughs> Nothing from state, Your Honor. Nothing. 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 Rule 5 of the South Carolina Rules of Criminal Procedure provide that the state must disclose evidence to the defense and it's outlined in the rule what must be disclosed. The court has cited a portion of the rule that indicates the information that is not subject to disclosure. D1 of that rule provides that upon a sufficient showing, the court may at any time order that the discovery or inspection be denied, restricted, or deferred, or make such other order as is appropriate. Upon motion by a party, the court may permit the party to make such showing in whole or in part in the form of a written statement to be inspected by the judge alone. If the court enters an order granting relief following such an ex parte showing, the entire text of the party statement shall be sealed and preserved in the records of the court to be made available to the appellate court in the event of an appeal. As I said at the beginning, we have two matters before the court, a motion to and the motion for protective order. The rules provide that the prosecution shall respond to the defendant's request for disclosure no, no later than 30 days after the request is made or within such other time as may be ordered by the court. In this case, on the 30th day, the parties entered into discussions, negotiations regarding an agreement as to a protective order.
parties could not agree, and immediately thereafter, the defense filed a motion to compel the state, then file a response indicating that that disclosure was delayed based on the party's inability to enter into a protective order. So in, a, in essence, both uh, matters are merged into one, in a sense. Now, the um, state must provide discovery, and the state has indicated a willingness to provide discovery. Of course, it's, it's automatic that the state must provide discovery. Uh, and as the Attorney General indicates, he was prepared to push the same button and provide the discovery requested. Provided that some reasonable limitations be made in connection with the dissemination of information that should be protected. Information. typically be restricted in a high profile case. And other sensitive information. In this case, I have been assigned to preside over 80 indictments of various sorts. Since the initial bond hearing, Mr. Murdoch has been indicted for several other cases involving um, his former law firm and family. <coughs> involving uh, matters involving law firm necessarily involve uh, privileged attorney client information. Investigation beyond that deals with print, sensitive crime scene photographs, uh, and based on the nature of the indictments having been issued since the bond hearing, uh, and the fact that that grand jury has not ended its service on a proper showing, which appears to be the case in an ongoing investigation. It would be improper and, and an improper intrusion into that investigation for there to not be some restrictions placed on dissemination of evidence in this case. It was pending in the case in Mallory Beach, uh, pending lawsuit against Mr. Murdoch and others involving the dissemination of sensitive information. Mr. Harpootin referenced the $15 million verdict awarded Kobe Bryant, uh, his spouse, the late Kobe Bryant, and the late Gigi Bryant. Mr. Harpootin also referenced notion of a special master involving uh, sort of a hint of what's going on in Mar-a-Lago. Mar uh, so there, these issues abound as to what information should or should not be uh, restricted in a case such as this. court has a responsibility to independent responsibility and, op and obligation to avoid the creation of a, as some courts said, a, a carnival type atmosphere in the case of this nature. And I will do all that I can to limit that. But in this case, we've gone from the parties seeking an agreement regarding in effect, a, a gag order uh, just several weeks ago to being uh, 
the extreme odds at this point claiming that there is violations of the rules. Extrajudicial statements are permitted, but they must be limited in accordance to reasonable restrictions that ensures the rights of both the state and the defense to fair trial, in addition to the right of the public to receive as much information as is possible. In most instances, that information becomes available during the course of the trial and not pre-trial. Therefore, in this instance, I am ordering the state to compel with discovery, comply with discovery, forthwith. I'm also issuing a temporary protective order restricting the defense from disseminating any information provided until the court has issued a more formal, more permanent order. Of course, any order issued by the court would be modified, and this does not in any way limit parties to make extra judicial statements in accordance with the rules, nor does it uh, restrict parties from addressing any, any uh, disclosing any information independently discovered, nor does it restrict the parties from addressing information already in the public domain, <coughs> such as has been referenced in this year. I'll have Mr. Uh, Warner submit to the court a proposed order. Uh, Mr. Harpootin and the defense will have an opportunity to review and comment on that. Uh, but this is a case that cries out for the issuance of the protective order, not a blanket protective order, but, but one that addresses the issue most relevant. Mr. Harper. Your Honor, one other matter that is, is part of this is, as Your Honor knows, um, all the search warrants in this case were sealed. Um, this, we've been indicating, we've been indicating to us that the prosecution would unseal those search warrants so that we could see what the affidavits looked like. And even though the <coughs> sua sponte order issued by Your Honor and others only governed the affidavit, we've never seen the results of any of those search warrants. So you know, if you also order the state to give us the unsealed search warrants. Right. Yes, yes, sir. Obviously, and the state's been clear from day one. If we get a the protective order address, which of course your honor just did, then we're happy also to agree that the search warrants should be unsealed pursuant to the protections of the protective order, as your honor just discussed. And your honor, will you get us that draft of that protective order by close of business today or first thing tomorrow morning so we get the show on the road? Glad to. The court orders the Unsealing of search warrants uh, to include the providing of affidavits and returns to the search warrants. And Your Honor, they were not only issued by you, but for instance, Judge Mullen issued some, other magistrates issued some. We're, we're talking about all search warrants. Yes, I believe the order of the Supreme Court giving you all pretrial authority uh, that would apply to any order, regardless of, uh, of which judge issued it. And Your Honor, we, we will be able to, if, if we have a laptop that we can take to the jail, not leave written documents down there. And as soon as we get this material, can we begin that process with Mr. Mr. Murdoch? Mr. Um, Mr. Waters and Mr. Griffin both mentioned the standing order regarding the discovery in the federal court. And this uh, is the Florence Division, one of which I received a copy of discovery that standing board of government discovery. <coughs> it's 
states in part, under no circumstances are copies of these three categories of discovery materials be released into the jails. I certainly understand that there's difficulty with a person in jail doing discovery in some special Provision must be made in this instance to address those issues. But it's, it's a no-brainer that uh, sensitive, private, uh, other related discovery materials should, should be restricted. So, so, so if we have a laptop with non-statewide grand jury material on it, just, the, just what we get on the homicide case, can we take that to the jail, have somebody sit with Mr. Murdoch, not let him look at it, and then bring that laptop back? Can we do that? That's that's generally the reading room procedure, and I'll be happy to discuss that further. I don't believe really there's a main issue that's coming up with something along those lines. We need to have a hearing before the jail folks. We can have a hearing before the jail folks. Well, we we talked to the jail folks extensively. The problem is not the laptop. The problem is not access. The problem is getting more than one hour every other day. And that is the problem. And perhaps the Attorney General would offer us a conference room at the Attorney General's office. We could spend seven or eight hours a day with Mr. Murdoch um, reviewing documents. Or they could bring him to my office. I don't have any problem with security guards coming there uh, during the day. But, but again, this is not due process to get to see it one hour every other day. I'm happy to consider all reasonable options. Obviously, in the end, I'm going to defer to the security concerns of the, those who are responsible for the custody of the defendant. The court will address any and all problems as they arise. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Anything further on this day? Not from the state, Your Honor. Not from the defendant, Your Honor. We will stand adjourned. Three mics right here.